Nope. Cool. All right. Last time we were talking, we finished, well, we started talking about crystal field theory. A week from today, and we're done, guys. One more week. Woo. One, two more classes. And one, one test. <laughs> one test. So crystal field theory. What is crystal field theory? Or what is the, the purpose of it? You to explain spectra, structures, and magnetism. Right. So it's a way to talk about structures, talk about um, if the system is magnetic or not, and to look at some experimental observations. So how is this theory constructed? What do we do? You use the metals and the ligands. Yep. Consider metals and ligands. And what's special? How do we treat the ligands? As point charges. And then what do we do to this entire system? The orbitals are in the uniform electric field. Yep. Electric field. Then what we did, we drew a structure. We talked about the crystal structure. Of Fe3 plus. The first thing we had to do was determine how many D electrons Fe3 plus had. Could you give me the condensed configuration of just iron? AR3D5. Yep. Oh. Or, 4s2, uh, 3d6. Yeah, 4s2, 3d6. And then if we, that's not the system we're looking at. We're looking at the world's fuzziest system right now. Am I? There we go. We were looking at Fe3+, plus, so let's write out the configuration for Fe3+. Plus. We still have AR, that noble gas center. What's going to come next? Yep. So just the 3D, uh, yep, 3D5. So this metal, it would be considered a D5 metal, which means in the ligand field, we're only going to have five electrons. Then what we drew, we drew, okay, if we just had the Fe by itself, And remember, we're just drawing the d orbitals. So how many how many orbitals should I draw? Five. Yep. One, two, three, four, five. Then we said put it in electric field. And so the energy would get raised a little bit. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Then we would introduce the ligands. And we ended up with this splitting pattern. These orbitals had a T2G symmetry. These guys had a EG symmetry. This was the DXY, DXZ, DYZ. Then we had B is Z squared, B X squared minus Y squared. And then we indicated this, the difference between uh, the EG and the T2G orbitals. And what did, what did we label that? Delta O. Yep. And the O is for octahedral, right? Yeah. Okay. So now we're going to ask some questions about this. 
the first question I want to ask is, is why are the d is d squared and dx squared minus y squared orbitals destabilized? So meaning they go up in energy. So why are they going up in energy? Oh, I should have drawn this actually higher in energy than, than these. Well, anybody got a reason? Why did they destabilize? Because they're higher in energy. True, what caused them to be higher in energy? The ligands. Okay, specifically, what about those ligands? Um. Because remember, they're behaving as point charges, right? So let's think of the shape of these orbitals. Which ones are directly in line with the ligands? So if I have, I don't know, a metal, got ligand, ligand. Like that, right? Are there any orbitals that are right along these ligands? Or approach these ligands directly? So one would like, I think that's the D, mm -hmm. D squared. Yep, so that one's going up and down like this. It has that light. Okay. And then what other one? I don't really remember what the dx squared, dy squared looks like. Well, you said that, that these p orbitals, like the ligands, are right along here, right? Yep. Okay. So that accounts for that ligand and that ligand, right? What do you think the dx squared minus y squared looks like? Or how is it aligned? Just as those are. Yeah. Which, which should look way more symmetric. That's terrible. <laughs> But we have ligands along that orbital. Okay. okay. If you check your book, there's a way better picture of this. Um, but basically the point charges are approaching these orbitals. So like, like charges do what? Repel. Attract light. Yep. They repel one another. So as we get them closer, they're going to cause these orbitals to destabilize. They're going to get higher in energy. Does that make sense? OK. So if you noticed in this diagram, we didn't put any electrons. We're going to ask the question, why did we not fill electrons for our last drawing? So why, why didn't we put in electrons? Is there point charges? The electrons aren't point charges, they're contained in, well, the D, excuse me, the D electrons are not point charges. Isn't they are certain, here. It's not it's certain where the electrons, what orbitals they go to. Why not? Uh, because 
good question. I don't know. I just felt like the right answer. When I came <laughs> that, that is the right answer. They're all symmetric. So, I mean, does it really matter? Yep, it matters. Like, for going to... I guess it can change on the ligand, too, depending on what the ligands are. So, yep. and how that certain orbital will react with each ligand. So... I'm sorry, could you yep. repeat the question? <laughs> yeah, so the question is, is why didn't I plunk electrons in here? And like Josh said, ligands make a big impact. What else is gonna make an impact in this drawing? They're all technically, I mean, you said that they're all pretty close in energy level, theoretically. I remember you saying something. Oh, like the that. ligands? Or the, no, these, the orbitals. Like the dxy uh, and the if they were, well, then it would make well, sense that the bottom row would get electrons first, but it's... So the T2G, they're all close to one another in energy. The EG are close to one another in energy. We can't really say how close these two are right now, because we don't know that delta O. If we do know that delta O, um, then, we can, then we can know which way the electrons are going to go. Now, you might automatically think they all just fill in down here, right? They should all just go to that T2G. But what, what electronic effects influence, influence that? The electronic exchange. Yep, electronic exchange. And then there's another one we talked a lot about. And when we were talking about electron configurations earlier in the semester. So we got electronic exchange. What else do we got? Um, is it the interaction between the nucleus and stuff? It has to deal with that. So it's coulombic. Yep, coulombic. So you got exchange and coulombic forces that are, are causing these electrons to kind of bop up into higher energy levels because there's energetic <laughs> penalties for squishing them in the same region, right? So we have to consider both of those things. So to answer this question, why don't we fill in our electrons in our last drawing? The value of delta O. will change the configuration. Okay. So let's talk about, whoa, high spin versus low spin. If I can get this thing to focus. There we go. High spin versus low spin. Okay, so um, we're gonna again consider Fe3 plus ligand field. Diagram. Oh, excuse me, crystal field diagram. Again, we said Fe3 plus, what type of D metal is it? Five. Fe5. The other thing is, is we're going to say that we have an octahedral. System. So. Let's say we have a system like this. So if you had to fill this system, how would you fill it? Bottom to top. Mm -hmm. So like how many, how many electrons in these orbitals? How many electrons in these orbitals? It'd be, they all be in the bottom, so you'd have two, two, one. Okay, yep. Doctor? Now, we could also have another possibility. 
Yep, each one has one. Same orbital labels, though. OK, this system, this system is considered the low spin, meaning that this one is the high spin. The reason we're talking about high spin and low spin here is, is high spin, you have un, more unpaired electron densities. OK? Does that make sense to people? Or at least can you see those two possibilities? Yeah. Is this more of like, because technically the spin would cancel out in the first one, so it's considered lower spin? Is that like the idea behind it? Or Yep, because okay. you have alpha and beta spins. Yep. Um, that, that cancel one another out. So you have low spin and high spin that way. So how many unpaired electrons do you have in the low spin case? Just one. Yep, high spin. All five. Yeah, all five. That makes sense? Yeah, what does, a two, what does the T, 2G, and the EG stand for? These are orbital labels. So remember back when we talked about like molecular orbital theory and symmetry? Oh, yeah, okay. These are symmetry labels of those orbitals. Okay. And we keep, we keep specifying them because when we go to molecular orbital theory to explain like these systems, it'll make more sense. There will be a connection there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No? Okay. So we're going to ask the question, why would we ever get the high spin case? Because that doesn't look like it's following the Aufbau principle. So can you give me, can you give me an idea? Delta O is small enough that could a Coulombic um, exchange and also the exchange energy overcome it, then mm -hmm. they would both, it would end up like the high spin. Yep, exactly. Like you said, there's that Coulombic and exchange energy. They're an energetic penalty, right? So, yep. um, and there is an energetic penalty. Pair these electrons up. In an orbital. And just like you said, John, we got that Coulombic energy and exchange energy. So could you guys describe to me like what these two energies are again really quick. So like Coulombic's all about just simply like charge next to each other. Yep, and exactly. like is gonna repel. Mm -hmm. While exchange energy is about the electrons wanting to all be ubiquitous um and like have the same like look the same. Yeah. So if you're gonna have paired electrons, it's technically gonna make the exchange energy go up. Mm -hmm. Yep. Because they're in that way, they're distinguishable from one another. And like we saw in physical chemistry, like when we talk about exchange, there is a, a penalty there. It's just a quantum chemical property that comes out from the Heisenberg uncertainty, or excuse me, the Pauli exclusion principle. Okay. Heisenberg uncertainty principle is the other 95% of the research, <laughs> PCHEM. Okay. So, um, based upon the type of metal that we have, we actually get different um, configurations too. So the number of D electrons helps us identify or guess what is the molecular geometry going to look like. So, what we're going to do, we're going to make a table and have a coordination number. We're going to have geometry 
and we're going to have what type of deconfiguration. Okay. We're only going to talk about three. We have two fours we're going to discuss, one five, one six, and one eight. Okay, six, you guys can tell me what type of geometry that coordination number is going to have. Octahedral. Yep. Yeah. And the systems that tend to be octahedral are D0, D3, D5, and D6 metals. Five coordinated? Let's see, so. Nope. Uh, this is going to be square pi or square pyramidal. Uh, um, we're going to have uh, trigonal bipyramidal. Yep, yeah, we're going to go with trigonal bipyramidal. All the other geometries that you listed are possible. This just happens to be the more more probable one, the one that pops up a lot more. Is this just because of like dealing with metals and their D orbitals that that's how it likes to be? There are a couple reasons for it. Okay. <laughs> that we could say that, yeah. It's just like kind of the argument too of everything's trying to be as low in energy as it possibly can be. Yeah, sure. And this is just more profitable. It's like when trees are like that, or when when biologists are like, this is a birch tree because of the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's pretty neat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and trees are like I don't know if you're quoting it. nature walks or not, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're forced to go on nature walks right now. That's how we get our, our outside time. Four coordinated. Four. Um, we got two of them. One of them tetrahedral. Yep. Planar. Yep. Tetrahedral and square planar. Square planar complexes, they can be D8, tetrahedral, or D0, D5, and they tend to be high spin systems in D10. Oh, I forgot to indicate that the D5 for here are low spin, that's an LS for low spin. For three coordinated, we tend to have T-shaped. They can also be D8 and dodecahedral. <laughs> the best uh, dice in Dungeons and Dragons. D2. We don't see too many of these guys though. Okay, so that way we can kind of predict what type of the uh, geometry you're going to have. On your guys' classroom assignment, you actually have to draw the crystal field diagram for a handful of these different shapes. And you have to consider the molecular shapes and the d orbitals that are coming in. Okay. Rough. Rough. <laughs> it, it's not that bad. It says that now. Yeah. All right. So last question we're going to ask, what is the major flaw? of crystal field theory. Can you move it up to the three really quick? Like this? Okay, yeah, I'm good then. Okay. Yeah, oh, I'm good. Okay. So what, what problems do we have with crystal field theory then? Any approximations that seem kind of like garbage? Or Ligands aren't point charges. Yeah, that's a big one. So. <laughs> Ligands are not point charges. All interactions in a transition metal complex are not just electrostatic. So what we need, we need a better model.
Okay, so now we're going to move away from this crystal field theory. Um, we're going to go to another theory called ligand field theory, which makes slight improvements upon what we've previously discussed. So ligand field theory. We're going to shorten that to LFT. Okay. And what it is, is it's kind of like a combination between crystal field theory and MO theory. And MO theory. So in ligand field theory, metal orbitals, or excuse me, metal valence orbitals and um, the, the frontier orbitals on the ligands interact to make metal ligand orbitals. Frontier orbitals on ligands interact to make metal ligand orbitals. So we're actually considering some real interactions here. It's not as complicated as MO theory, so the, I, the picture is a little more simplistic, which helps explain things a bit better. Sometimes MO theory gets really complicated and it's hard it's hard to see the forest through the trees kind of mentality. Okay. So question that we're going to ask. So what valence orbitals on the transition metals are going to interact with the ligand orbitals? So TM stands for transition metals. Interact with ligand orbitals. So let's look at a couple different rows. SC to ZN. Yttrium to cadmium, lanthanum to mercury. So what valence orbitals in that in that fourth period do you think? There we go. Try and show that a little bit. What orbitals do you think are going to be involved with bonding for your, like this, this row? Three D orbitals. Um, yep, definitely three D. Go we'll put three D. Any other ones that might be energetically accessible? Um, if they're not in a like a transition or ionized state, then I guess they're four S orbitals. Yep. And finally, any others that might be close by? 3P? Yep, so not 3P. Actually, 4P. 4P, yeah, wait, 4P? But yep. 4P. Yeah, I would have figured have? it would have been 3P. But wait, so have? why, oh, because they're, 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 they're just not filled. Right, they have them, they're just not filled. Okay, for the next row, it'll be 4D, 5S, 5P, then the lanthanides and stuff, 5D, 6S, 6P, and then sometimes, what other orbitals do these guys, like lanthanide, <laughs> yep, and sometimes the F. Sometimes. 
So we'll have to consider those when we draw our diagrams and what's going to happen. All right. So let's do a little refresher on some, some information that we have to revisit to properly make these diagrams. Question, what two properties determine if orbitals will interact? What things do you have to consider? Uh, their charges. Yeah. Oh, the orbitals themselves don't have. Oh, the charge. orbitals. Uh, if they're filled or if they're empty. Mm, maybe no, no. No, I'm talking about like if if you're going to have two atomic orbitals overlap to make a molecular orbital, what things do you have to consider? Are they going to be in the same area, like um, their distance from each other? Kind of. Yeah. When you say this, oh yeah, you mean distance, like physical. Like their the, the nucleic distance, I would say. Kind of. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I should have changed this to three. <laughs> three properties. There we go. So distance. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Be a little more specific. It's probably a million. So, like geometry then. Two. So yeah, geometry. Like distance, configuration. We'll leave distance and geo together. Oh, okay. Okay, what else? Specifically about the orbitals that are overlapping. Are they filled or not? No, that doesn't matter. What type matter. of bond they're forming? Is it sigma yep. pi? Right, so symmetry. If you have the wrong symmetry, they'll never, you, they don't interact with one another. And then last, what other things matter? So when you said distance, I wasn't sure if it was relating to this other topic. So just energy level? Yeah, so energetic difference. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're gonna hop back to um, some symmetry stuff and some point group things, which I know you guys really love. But let's consider symmetry of six sigma donor orbitals on six ammonia ligands. So we have an octahedral type symmetry. Uh, we, what we can, you can show this, the reducible rep. So I'd ask you guys, <clears throat> what type of operations we could have in that type of point group? What's one that we're always going to have? E. Yep. Right. yep. E. Then we got eight C threes, six C twos, six C fours, three C two primes, eyes, and proper rotations. Sigma H plane and six sigma Ds. And if you look at those reducible representations, zero, zero, two, two, zero, 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 four, two. Okay. Anybody know the reducible, or excuse me, irreducible representations that fall out of this thing? But what is the 3C2 prime? Uh, that has to deal with uh, where it's located in terms of the principal axis. 
Okay. Anybody want to tell me that you're reducible reps? I'm going to grab my character table. Yeah, exactly. You'd have to grab a character table. You'd have to do that whole like matrix thing. And look uh, at no, your so no, I don't. I don't want to tell you it. I don't yeah. want to talk about it. <laughs> I don't either. So we're just going to go to the conclusion. But this reduces to. I can guess you will know two of the reducible represent, or excuse me, the irreducible representations based upon those symmetry labels we talked about in crystal field theory. What are those two orbital labels we always had? EG and 2TG. EG. Actually, we're going to have T1U. So we got a T, a G. Q. And an AG. Okay. So now, what we're going to do, we're going to draw some diagrams. You're going to want to leave yourself some space. This will probably take up a quarter of a page. Okay? Uh, what we're going to do what now is... is Josh? <laughs> <laughs> Josh is disappointed. I'm eating um, up his notebook. Yeah, i got to go to a new page. So much wasted space. <laughs> So much potential. <laughs> this gone, blank slate. Okay. Now we're just going to consider the d orbitals interacting with six sigma orbitals don't from from these donor ligands. Okay. Let's start drawing some stuff. Well, can you go back to, or can you just show real quick what you had before? Sure. Interacting with... Ah, come on, focus. There we go. So we're just going to look at the D orbitals interacting with the, the sigma orbitals. All right, I'm all set. Okay. All right, so we're going to have our metal on this side. Our metal, how many orbitals do I need to write down for our metal? If it's just the uh, five, D orbitals. Yep. Five. One, two, three, four, five. Then we're going to have our six ligand orbitals. One, two. One, two, three, one. Okay. Now, it just so happens that these three metal orbitals have a T2G symmetry. These guys even is a T2G <laughs> symmetry. I do not like remember even discussing that one. Yeah, so it has to deal with triply, triply degenerate types of symmetry. Yeah, we didn't we didn't make it very far with those reducible reps. We just got like the first couple easy. Yep. Ones we talk about the first couple. They get more complex, but the idea is retained. We have EG. Then on this side, we have for the ligand orbitals, we have two that are EG symmetry. We have three that are T1U symmetry. <laughs> And then we have one that has an A1G symmetry. Yeah, you 
just making these up. <laughs> yeah, I'm just making stuff up right now. Uh, <laughs> they're just two letters and a number. And just, yep. Hey, that's what they all are, though. Oh, uh, you're just like, yeah, it sounds about right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'll buy it. <laughs> okay, so now let's look at when these guys interact and we get an ML6 type interaction. So basically we're forming an octahedral complex. Okay, tell me what orbitals are going to overlap between the metal and the ligand. The EG. The EG, yeah. EG are the only ones that are going to interact, right? So they're going to form a bonding and an antibond. So now let's label these. When we move from having um, like atomic orbitals we move from having capital letters to lowercase letters when they form a molecular orbital. So the symmetry label of this guy is going to be EG. What's the symmetry label of this one up here going to be? EG star. Yes. Great. What about the other ligands, and, or excuse me, the other orbitals in the system? What they happens to them? They don't have the same symmetry, so they can't really interact. Yeah, they don't have the same symmetry. They don't interact. What type of orbitals are these? Non-bonding. Yeah, they're non-bonding. So they should retain the same energy. They might be a little bit lower in energy if we allow mixing to happen. So how many dashes should I draw parallel to this, these orbitals? Seven. Uh, or four. Yep, so four. four there, and then oh, okay. three, uh, three, four. How many up here? Three. Yep. One, two, three. Okay, let's label these guys. What's the orbital label for this one going to be? T two G, but lowercase T. Yep. Um, there are two sets of orbital labels here, what are they? T1U and A1Z. Yep. So T1U, oops, that should be a lowercase t, T1U. And then A1G. Very colorful. Yeah, you got to be. It's going to get more complicated. <laughs> Great. Yeah. This energetic difference, what is it? Dorito. Yep. Dorito. Oh, yeah, because there's an O on it. We've been inside way too long, people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've seen this before. This is actually the crystal field diagram that comes out, which is pretty cool to see. Now, let's include the S and P orbitals. Can I move this up? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> This is going to get more complicated. Perfect. You might need well, more colors. So are we drawing that but including more? Yes. No. Okay. I am really bad at spacing this stuff out. Yeah. Say like well, a quarter of a paper. I have and a like, better idea of how much space. This I one is going to take up like half of a page. All right. <laughs> so we got our energy. We have our metal again. We have our six ligands. They have the same type of symmetry. So we got the D orbitals, one, two, three, four. 
One, two, three, four, five. Six. Six. Yep. <laughs> there are six of them. Shouldn't there be five D? Oh, actually, don't draw this. I got to make the energies different. Yeah. Did a bad job already. All right. Try that again. Hopefully, it didn't copy exactly what I did. Sorry. Ligands. These guys are higher in energy. D, e, one, two, three, four, five. Ligands are lower in energy. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. And we said we're also considering the S and the P. Three. The S orbitals end up higher in energy in these complexes. You're wondering why this S is higher in energy. Okay, let's label some of these symmetries. We'll try to keep the same colors. We got EG. There's two yeah. EGs. Yep, there are two, two EGs. What else do we got? What was the label? T2G. Yep. We got T2G. What other labels do we have? We got the T1U yep. for three of them. For three of them. The P's also up here, they have a T1U. And then last one. It's an A1G. Yep. And actually, that's what the one that's S up top has type of symmetry. I think I'm getting carpal tunnel. <laughs> it's happening. Get ready. <laughs> Touch your fingers. Get everything out. Just, oh. Yeah, just gotta stretch it out. Eh? Okay, tell me what's gonna happen here. We're gonna get some overlapping. Oh yeah, we are. Tell me what's gonna overlap with what? E G, A1 mm -hmm. P, and T1 U. Yep. So EG, how many orbitals do we have to draw there? Two. Yep. One, two. One, two. And what are their labels? Lowercase EG. Yep. And then we got EG star, right? And like, how are you determining how high you're putting that? <laughs> Like... experience and calculations. Okay. Is it supposed to be the same height as the S one? So it's, it's close. Chemical, chemical intuition is what I heard. Yep, chemical intuition. Way too much time staring at this stuff. <laughs> okay, next. What other type of overlap are we going to have? Which one do you want to do next? Do the A1G. Yeah. A1G? Okay. That one's going to be the lowest in energy, which is also going to make it shoot up in energy a bit. That should be a little bit lower in energy than the T1U. Okay, so we got these guys, we got a1G, what are we going to label this one up top? A1G star. Yep. Yeah. 
Okay, other overlaps? I just have your T one U's. Yep. And since these guys are really far apart in energy, they're not going to have a ton of overlap, but they do have some. Two, three, they, this should be a bit lower in energy, but I screwed up. <laughs> and what label are we gonna give those? Nice little lower case. Yep. We got T, oops, T, one U and T, one U star. Finally, any orbitals that did not hybridize? Yep. One, two, three. Can do anything? E, B, G. And this energetic difference. What is that? Dorito zero. Yep. It's the octahedral field splitting. Our fancy Dorito. And you can see as you add more of these electronic states in, the diagram starts to become more and more complicated. But you get better explanations with them. So the cool thing with all of this is, is we find our simplified model. And our complex model. So if we just focus on these parts right along here, that's basically our crystal field diagram, right? Uh, yeah. So the crystal field diagram is kind of inherently hidden in this ligand field diagram, which is pretty cool to see. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna ask, question. Why is knowing that octahedral field splitting useful? So what, why, why is that beneficial to know? Is it because you can like base everything else off of that? When you say that, can you be a little like, more explicit? When you're doing the calculation to figure out these different energy levels, is that like the, is that relatively easy to find? And when you find no. it, you kind of have like a gauge to like measure everything else from, from that like distance that you're getting from that. Yep. Yeah, you can, you can factor it that way. Um, what Experimentally, what does it tell us? The difference in energy mm -hmm. between EG star. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so what it can do is, is it, what, what's gonna change how high, or, how high or low this EG star is going to move? Difference in energy between the molecular orbitals of the ligand and metal. Yeah, exactly. So looking at this, these uh -huh. energetic differences, we know about the strength of this interaction. If the strength changes, this value is going to change. So it lets us know about the strength of the interaction. of metal with ligand. What other things, what, what, why do we even care about like delta O to begin with, even with crystal field theory? What, 
was the importance of it? So what does delta O tell us about, like if we have a D5 complex, why would it be important to know the octahedral field splitting? Just like to be able to tell if it's gonna be high spin or low spin. Yep. Let's us know. If high or low spin. And then the last one we're going to talk about kind of later on, uh, it's, it gives it its color. It's responsible for its color. Unfortunately, we didn't get to go into the lab and make some of these, which I wanted to do for PCAM. And what you see is, is they're really vibrant, pretty colors. They're like purples and greens. It's the, it's the most, they call inorganic labs colorful labs because all the complexes you generate are really pretty. Very carcinogenic product. <laughs> so those were pi donor ligands. We're going to ask the question, what about pi acceptor ligands. And we could draw out another diagram if people want to do that. Um, those all just sigma donor? Those were all just sigma donors. <laughs> all right, sure. I, I, I thought you said <laughs> pi donor. I'm like, oh, did I say pi donor? Yeah. Those are all- Maybe at one point all, you did, yeah. Oh, okay. Those are all sigma donors, but what about like pi acceptor ligands? We could draw another MO diagram. But the important point is, is um, the pi acceptor ligands have T2G, oops, capital T2G, T1G, T1U, and T2U symmetry. Are you saying they, they can have or they will have all of those? They, they will have those. Okay. If you have six of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So keeping that in mind, I'm going to rip this off for a second. <laughs> Not that I don't have the luxury of at the board. How is that going to impact this diagram? You added T2U. Yep, there's T2U. And TG. Yep. Two. You're going to get less P and, um, interaction so too. So are any of these going to have more overlap? Or yeah, are they going to overlap with the metal? Yeah, T2G is going to form a lot of those. T2G, we also, we don't have any T1Gs, we don't have any <laughs> T2Us, but we do have a T1. So those orbitals are going to be influenced. Specifically, what's going to happen is, is the level of this T2G is going to be shifted up or down based upon that interaction. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Does anybody want to go through and draw another orbital introducing a bunch more symmetry and getting more complicated? No. Do you think it's beneficial to our education? It's going to be on the exam. <laughs> I don't. The important point is to know is that pi acceptor and donor ligands, they mess with this T2G energy level. And if you look in your, um, in your books, there are an couple awesome diagrams. Actually, it's figure 10.6. It shows the exact diagram that I'd want to draw. Okay, so I feel like we don't feel like drawing that one, right? No. no. Okay. <laughs> Read it over, understand why introducing these new pi star, these pi acceptor uh, ligands 
influences this diagram. Is that it, what pi star means? Is pi acceptor? Um, usually it's the pi star ligand that accepts electron density. Not all the time, but most of the time. Okay, so what about pi acceptor ligands? They, they basically mess with the T2G hybrid orbitals. which influence that, that octahedral field splitting. Okay. All right, so those are all the impacts that we can have. We're gonna talk about the consequences of that in a little bit. The easiest way to see this is actually through spectroscopy or a visual inspection. You can use UV vis spectroscopy to look at this interaction. The other thing is, is you can look at the color. The color itself can actually tell you how the ligands are changing the crystal field diagram or the ligand field diagram, which is, awesome because you can visually say okay we're going from uh like red to blue that means what we have to dump in more energy yada yada and you can rationalize these things so um let's talk more about this orbital splitting so orbital splitting and electronic spectra or excuse me, electronic spin. So again, this delta O, it's basically a measure of how strong the metal and ligand are interacting. The metal and ligand interact. So again, we're talking about an octahedral system because it's the easiest to discuss. What are the symmetry labels of these three degenerate orbitals again? All right, sorry, what was the question? Yep, so what is the symmetry label of these orbitals? T2G. Yep, up top. EG. Yep. And that guy again is the active hedral field split. So there's some terminology we need to discuss. Strong field ligands. What that means is, is you have a large octahedral field splitting, delta O. What about if we have weak fields? Oh yeah, small delta O? Yep. Okay, so now the question I wanna ask is, is what do we have to consider to know if we're going to have a strong field ligand or a weak field? Question. What should one consider when determining if a ligand is a strong field or a weak field? Ligand.
Didn't we just say it was the delta O that we got to consider? Right. We want to consider that delta O, but what what lets us know about that delta O? Like, let's say we just we we don't have a supercomputer to do the calculation, to show us that orbital diagram. I don't think. What things are we going to consider based upon these diagrams that we just drew? Um, so what's going to influence this? Energy. <laughs> energy, specifically the energy of what? This is all about the energy, the, the strength of the interactions. So, yeah, this strength of the interaction. So what type of interactions can we have? Sigma or pi? Or... Yep, sigma and pi. So the ones that we're going to consider, sigma donation. So remember, this is the diagram that we had for sigma donor ligands. As these two orbitals interact more strongly, what is going to happen to delta O? Um, the larger delta O? Yep, why larger? Um, I'm not sure. Is was the it, energy because the difference of EG and EG star would increase? Yes, this energy level, these energy levels are going to increase. So this energy is just going up while the T2G is remaining consistent, right? So yes, delta O increases. Then we have pi donation. And we'll talk about pi acceptance. So let's hop back to this. Actually, I'll pull up this diagram. Fair enough, we'll just go with this. So we said that we had some pi orbitals that had T2G symmetry, right? If we have a pi acceptor ligand, what is this going to interact with? D orbital. Yep, the D orbital is going to interact with this guy, right? If these, oops, shut up my phone. Okay, so if these guys are pi accepting, meaning they're going to overlap with these, they're actually going to drive this energy down, typically. So if this energy gets driven down, what happens to delta O? Increase or decrease? Decreases. Increase. What? Yeah, increase. Because this is getting lower. That T2G is going lower. The EG is going to stay the same. So for pi accepting, you increase delta O. For pi donating, what do you think is going to happen? Decrease. Yep. Okay, so with that in mind, we're going to ask a couple of questions. So, question, which is a stronger field ligand? Ethylene diamine or ammonia? Ian. So what are we really talking about here? What type of ligands are these? Um, pi donating, or excuse me, sigma donating, sigma accepting, pi donating, or pi accepting? One out of four shot. I donating. Nope, they don't interact with the pies at all. Sigma donating, then. Yep. Because if you think about ammonia, 
got that lone pair that can only make a sigma bond. So these guys are sigma donating, right? Right. Oops. Is there any experiment or any anything that we could look up that let us know how good this guy is at sigma donating? It's PKA. Yep. So substance, we got ethylene diamine, we got ammonia, and you can look up their PKAs. Ethylene diamine is 9.928, where ammonia is 9.245. So, which one is the stronger field ligand? NH3. Or EN. <laughs> what do people think? Yeah. It's EN. I'm going to say EN. It's donating it. It wants to get rid of them. So, which one's a better base? Based the on NH3. Yeah. Remember, PKA, opposite it's... interaction with PKB. Yeah. So. So NH3 is a better base? Or what do you mean opposite interaction? <laughs> Remember, <laughs> negative. Larger P, a larger KA means a stronger acid, but PKA means you want a smaller PKA. Oh, okay, so PKA, yep. okay. PKA. So that means a smaller PKA is a stronger acid. So that means EN is a stronger base. Yep, so this guy's stronger base. And that's important because we're talking about sigma donors. So they are sigma donor ligands. EN is a stronger base. So delta O will be larger. meaning that's a stronger field. Okay, we're gonna do one more question. Because wait, do we end at 11.20 or 11.15? 11.15. Okay. Do people care if we do one more example? Sure, just remember this at the end of the year. <laughs> Thank you. Keep it all right, he's got a schedule, clearly. Okay, so let's ex ask another example. What about the halide ions? So again, we're gonna look up acids, HF, HCl, HBr, HI. If we keep track of their PKAs, we got 3.2, negative 7, negative 8, negative 9. So these are both sigma donors and what other type of ligand? Pi donors. Yep. Kind of weak on this end though. Okay, so let's try and determine which one's going to be the best base and which one's the HF. worst base. Yep. So HF is most basic. While I is the least. Well, isn't it HF is most basic? But I mean technically it's conjugate oh. would be a pretty strong. Yeah. Yeah, HF. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so when it comes to field strength, which one's going to be the strongest? Which one's going to be the weakest? 
H, F is going to be the strongest. Yep. Followed by what? HCl. Yep. Then? BrHi. Yep. Okay. Good multiple choice question for the exam. Exactly. Okay. So that's all I want to cover today. Are there any questions about what we discussed? And the concept is stronger bases are better or have a stronger field strength. Generally, yes. <laughs> okay. If they are a sigma donating do, or donating ligands, yes. Once you start throwing in pi pi stuff, it gets a little more complicated. Perfect. Yeah. Just what you wanted to hear, right? <laughs> Any other questions?